Hey, Mike, good seeing you. Always a pleasure, MikeCernovich.com. So today, we're going to have a fun conversation. A little bit drama, but we're not going to name names because I don't like to do drama. But there's this ongoing debate on how do rich people really live. And it's a funny debate because it's usually guys who are younger who always have to say, well, my rich friend does X, my rich friend does Y. And they're obviously you know, not rich themselves or whatever. So I'm just going to read something to you, something to you. And you can tell me if this is consistent with how quote unquote rich people live. Okay. The, the richest man I know doesn't even have a nice car or nice clothing. Funny how that works. What would you say to that? I would say that I've read the millionaire next door and I've read the millionaire mind. And I can tell you from being around many very wealthy people, I had an event uh, here at my uh, facility not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, uh, called Whiskey Talk. And I had a gentleman fly in from Romania and uh, he owns apartment buildings in Berkeley, California, um, Albany, California, all kinds of massive real estate holdings. And he owns a house on the ocean in Sicily has a uh, incredible place in Romania. And do you know what kind of car he drives? What kind? A smart car. Well, your, your answer is different than mine, which is, and maybe because okay. you're, you're, you're a little more diplomatic still because you knew the podcasting game. The, the richest guy I know, I, I know so many rich people that is crazy. The idea that, Rich people live like X, I think is kind of a silly thing that somebody who doesn't maybe have those things is telling himself so that he feels like he's like the rich people. I know rich people who, first of all, you would never know the rich, but I know rich people who enjoy every luxury, every car, every drug, every prostitute, every sugar, but everything that you could ever possibly imagine. And 100%. I know, and I know they enjoy kind of everything in between. And the reason I brought up that tweet is there's this little, it's all gossipy right now. And it involves a, a kind of a former kickboxer, Cobra Tate, who's very ostentatious with displays of wealth. And it seems to have made a lot of people jealous because they can't make those ostentatious wealth displays. And so they're trying to essentially say anybody who really has money doesn't display their money, but you have actually done well in life. And you know a lot of people who you have a roadster. You had a Tesla roadster, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah, I, 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 I'm not going to be one to tell you I don't, uh, I, I don't spend my money. I mean, I just sold a two and a half million dollar house here in Napa Valley. I've you know got fantastic cars. I own a Maserati. You know, whatever. Um, not everybody lives like that. That I, that I've encountered now. I can tell you that, you know, I've been down to Florida and spent time with some very wealthy folks down there that I know, you know, and they have fantastic yachts and huge houses and, and enjoy all the luxuries of life. But I also know some that don't do that. And so I don't want to say that you, I don't think it's possible to put them into a, um, into a box and say that every rich person does that because like I'm sitting here right now at my facility at the Napa airport. This is a pretty ostentatious place. It's a pretty ostentatious and um, uh, maybe self-indulgent to a, uh, uh, you know, a little bit. I mean, I paid a lot for this and you know, there's four of us that office out of here. Um, but you know, the guy next door, literally the guy next door to me has the same size facility as I have. And you know what he has it filled with? Porsche 911s. He rehabs and fixes up Porsche 911s. And that's what he spends his money on. But <clears throat> you go up to his house here in Napa Valley, he lives in maybe an eight or $900,000 house, but he's got millions of dollars worth of cars next door. <laughs> so, you know, right. I think everybody does it differently. Um, there are some guys out there that spend it, <clears throat> but you get into the situation of, you know, are you the guy that made a quick, a quick lick on maybe Amazon reselling, you know, dog toys or something like that. And you made 800 grand and you go out and spend 600 grand on a McLaren. Well, I mean, okay, but what do you have left? Yeah. And, and that's the point I was driving at is 
the there's kind of a subculture of young men who have never had wealth themselves or been around wealth, but they always have want to have an opinion, right? Everybody yeah. know oh this rich guy you know you know first of all you don't know how people really live. That's one of the things that I've learned in my as I'm 41 years old now is the number of truths about like first of all most successful people have had a nervous breakdown of some kind or another. This is true, yeah. um, but you never read about that. Everybody lies, pretends it doesn't happen. It's like the dirty little secret. So the really rich guys, you know, you, you don't even know them unless you know them well, unless you've seen them have a heart attack. I took a, I took a, a friend of mine, 33 years old. He thought he was having a heart attack, right? Because that was, that was the pace he was on. Nobody, nobody ever talks about that kind of stuff. So, so the idea that these kids, they know what a rich person is and how they truly live. You, you never know, how, first of all, how anybody lives because – life is unconventional, but I, I think there's a lesson in terms of there's ways to acquire wealth if you're middle class, and then there's ways that you can spend wealth, and the ways that people spend wealth are completely diverse. I know a guy who lives in a $50 million house, but he won't buy anybody coffee because he's a cheap, cheap ass, right? And you would say, right. well, how can somebody with the $50 million home be a cheap ass? Oh, it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> It's yeah. possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, and my, yeah, I was just talking about this guy that, that I'm friends with that, that lives in Romania. His place in Romania is fantastic. His place in Sicily is on the beach. And, you know, it's actually an apartment building that he purchased and then converted into a house with a couple guest homes. Okay. So he spends lavishly on certain things, but cars are not one of them, right? He doesn't go out. He doesn't drive a Lamborghini. He probably buy 50 Lamborghinis. Doesn't do that. Does he have a very nice house? Yes. Does he own, you know, uh, assets that generate, you know, income every day and every week and every year? Yes. Um, but he spends it in different ways. I mean, you know, we go to like, you know, the Barrett Jackson auction in Las Vegas, you know, and he gets the, the largest suite that they have at, at, you know, the Mandalay Bay and invites, you know, a handful of us to stay there. And we got a butler inside the place and, you know, we're, we're, he's picking up the tab for everybody. What's that end up costing him at the end of the day? 12 grand and he had one hell of a three or four day weekend. That's completely worth it. But he still drives a smart car. So I, you know, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's just people spend it in different ways. And there's no universal fact that if you make X, you're going to buy the Lamborghini and then you're going to buy this and you're going to buy this. And by the way, he, he is married to a Romanian supermodel. So, I mean, this guy's got it all, but he spends it very quirky how he spends the money. Right. And that's where... The again, the debate's so silly. The idea that rich people, everybody got rich the same way, or everybody lives the same way, but they are rich, or that everybody spends money the same way, it's really absurd because it's not true. Like for me, when I did pretty, like me, I'm basically myself, I'm poor because when I started having a family, I put all my money in trust funds for my kids, for my daughters, right? So I don't even live, I don't even live like a rich guy. But that said, I define rich as I can do whatever I want to do. But what I want to do is not, I don't want to drive a Lamborghini. And that isn't sour grapes, right? I never, never said, oh, I'm going to go buy a Lamborghini today. I, I, could, could have, I could go buy one. But it is about, to me, and this is what a, I think a lot of people who think deeply about money goes, it is about, can you do what you want to do? It's, and then you realize it's more about freedom. And then you realize that a lot of what we spend our money on is servitude, slavery, People go, why? Well, I mean, I always say people, you know, if you like nice watches, I'm not judging anyone. People can like what they like. But a lot of the consumption we do is to signal to other people that we have money. One of the more influential books I read on that was uh, Spent by Jeffrey Miller, I think it's called. And the idea is, well, I want people to know I'm successful and I walk into a room. So therefore, I'm going to have the Patek Philippe watch or the, you know, the gold submarine Rolex or whatever the case may be. And and all I'm really doing is signaling to people, or I'm going to drive that really expensive car to signal to women that, hey, I'm a good mate. So it becomes mate selection. But then you think, well, I mean, that car, $150,000, in LA, you can get a night with maximum level women. New York, any big city, you can get a night with maximum level women, $800. So if you just do the math, but you would say, well, I would actually have more, more results. 
if I just went, went to, but then people don't, but they don't want to have that self-honesty. They don't want to say, well, I'm driving this car because I want to impress people. Now that said, and again, this is why a lot of the debates are silly. There's no universality to it. I had a 2011 uh, BMW that was, you know, had a lot of things done to it that maybe shouldn't have been done. A lot of aftermarket parts and it was fun. And I enjoyed the heck out of that car and miss it. And it was only a $33,000 car. What kind of car was that, Mike? 2011, um, 335 sport. You put in aftermarket intake, aftermarket intercooler. There's all kinds of ways you can tune it up. You get, there's Alpina coating chips. There's a lot of different things you can do. Sure. You can get it so it can run. But anyway, there are people who love driving a car and I actually love driving that car. Uh, the only reason I don't have it now is I have kids and you know, so I have, I'm, I'm a minivan kind of guy, at least at this stage of my life. But there are people who they really love cars and that's cool. There are people who really love watches and that's cool. That said, people should be more honest with themselves. Yeah, am, am I really doing this to impress other people? Am I doing this to manufacture a persona? Or am I doing this because it's really authentically me and what I want? And then you realize how do rich people really live? They live just like everyone else. They live in all kinds of different ways. Right. Yeah, there is no universality to it. What, what's your take on, you know, the way that Cobra Tate has gone out and been able to trigger so many people, uh, especially recently, um, What's your take on that? I mean, he, he really has an ability to stir the pot when it comes to this, this question about wealth and how he approaches it. He's got an amazing energy about him when you, when you watch him uh, on some of his streams or even, you know, on Instagram and he does these little clips while he's driving around or wherever he is. I, I find it fascinating just to watch the guy. And I think I forwarded to you a couple emails from him that just, uh, completely blew my mind. I mean, he's just the way that he approaches this stuff. But what's your take on that, on, on where he is right now at this point in time over the past couple of weeks? Right. So Cobra, Cobra Tate is triggering insecurity in men. And uh, Alexander Cortez did the same thing. He triggered in, insecurities in men. And by that, if you are a man who just owns the douchebag factor, that triggers yes. people. And in a way that doesn't trigger you or me, I'm like, oh, that's kind of funny. Looks like they're having fun. But to me, I view it that way because I've done that. I've lived that way. I've, I've sure. had the fun and everything. And if I wanted to live that way again, I could. But most men view that as unattainable. And what they don't realize is that, you know, we talked earlier in a podcast about the law of attraction. I'm a bigger believer in the law of reflection, which is that the way you feel about a situation says less about what you're looking at and it's a mirror onto you. So you see Cobra Tate and you go, what a douchebag. No, no, no. You see in yourself that you're physically inadequate. You see in yourself that you, you're not good looking and you're not taking care of your body. You see in yourself that you don't have that car and you can't go zipping down the mountains. You see in yourself those women that you, you know, oh, I would never want a woman like that, but yet they masturbate to porn to women who look like that right so it's just a completely dishonest and authentic engagement that they have when they see them and that's the mirror and recognizing that is how you work on yourself you say okay yeah you're right I, I i feel that that's jealousy on my part okay i'm right. now i'm going to be honest with myself i'm going to say you know what i wish that i looked that way or talked that way or had the women or had the other things now the flip side to me is i've what, I, I see all that and I'm like, I'm glad he's having fun, but he's going to get bored with it. And then sure enough, I see him tweeting earlier today that I'm giving up drinking. I'm tired of waking up hungover. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're, it's fun. It's fun for, I always tell men, it's fun for about a year and a half at most. Usually about nine months is enough. And, right. and then it just becomes a recycled experience. But the, the broader point is people who, who look at that, they, they are, they are are feeling jealousy. Nothing triggers people like a confident man who can walk the walk. Even Muhammad Ali, they would call him arrogant. He said, ain't bragging if you can do it. There's really nothing. Like I, I had all this media articles about me because I wrote a fashion thread. And yeah. there's nothing in, in, in their takedowns to me. They failed to admit, no, this is a tall, good looking guy with a nice body, right? 
this isn't, I'm not pretending to be Tyson, the supermodel or something like that. You know, I'm, I'm realistic, but this is objectively speaking, people look at me and I'm an attractive man. And especially at the time I was even younger and even more better looking. So what they see, they're just triggered. They're triggered by a good looking man. And I'm sure that's true too. Men get that way when they see a beautiful woman, uh, what a B I, you know, T C H or whatever they think, because they want, it all goes back to Aesop's fable of sour grapes. They can't grab it. They can't reach up and grab it. So they say there must be some flaw with it. Where me, I just admit, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't have that. Maybe I want that. Maybe I should, maybe I should look, look into myself a little bit about that. Right. That's that. And that's a great piece right there is that it, just being able to look at that and then realize, Hey, what am I reflecting back on that? Right. What am I taking from that? Because if I am looking at that and saying, geez, that guy is such a douchebag or whatever. Well, maybe I need to stop and think and say, maybe that's where I am. How can I fix that piece of my mindset uh, to be a little bit different? But yeah, this whole wealth thing is, is a interesting piece. And I, it's fascinating how much uh, this character, uh, Cobra, has really triggered some of these uh, beta males out there. Um, uh, the vitriol and hate that's launched at him on Twitter is really, it, it's, well, it's entertaining to watch for sure. No, it's funny. And then there was media articles. There was, um, it was supposed to be, it was written in that very snarky, sarcastic style, which is, you know, because Andrew Tate had tweeted out that all the women, we're with him now. And then Barstool Sports, some, you know, schlub there writes an article. There are no women because Cobra Tate has them all. And it was ladled with sarcasm. But if you read it, you would, right. you would see, you know, you're just so jealous of this guy. And then I posted that link to my Facebook and I got nothing but hate from, from my crowd, people who follow me. What is this? It was just triggering to people. And again, it goes back to the cargo shorts thing. It's all the same principle, which is a, a well-put-together, successful man who owns it. None of this false modesty. One thing you learn, one of the great lessons I learned from Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is that if you really want to do things in society, you have to self-deprecate because it triggers people. Uh, a man who just has it all together and owns it, trigger people. Muhammad Ali did. It doesn't matter your race. Andrew's doing it. I've done it. Alexander Cortez did it. Jacob Wall's done it. It, tr it triggers people if you just own it. And one, one skill that I kind of had to learn is that's why when people meet me, they go, well, I didn't really, you're so big, right? Like in real life. Cause when I take pictures, I'm always leaning down and everything because you really do attract uh, of violence towards you. If you just say, look, yeah, I'm here. I am dude. I'm big gorilla welcome to the party, have fun. People go crazy. And again, that's because of they feel diminished even when you don't diminish them. Just by being there, they are seeing their own image and it's reflecting back on them and they're recoiling in horror. Yeah. I do want to say one last thing about this, uh, about this whole wealth factor. And that's that I think that people really get caught up in some of the flash in, in, in wealth and, and, Certainly, there is a place for that, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying the uh, rewards of, of your hard work. The reality is, and the studies show this, and, and I can certainly link to them um, on our podcast here, but the studies show that the vast majority of multimillionaires in the United States are blue-collar millionaires. They're not the ostentatious, flashy type. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not a piece of their life that they are very ostentatious with. I mean, maybe the guy's really into dirt bikes and four wheelers and he's got, you know, uh, three Polaris that, you know, those things are 30 grand a piece and he's got a bunch of four wheelers and he's got a farm that's 1200 acres in Montana that he has, you know, bison on and he rides his, his you know, four wheelers out there. So there might be a piece of their life where they really pour money into or, or maybe uh, uh, lavishly spend, but, the data and the reality is, is that the vast majority of multimillionaires, at least in the United States, are not ostentatious, but they're more of the blue collar millionaire type. Yeah. The, and again, the millionaire next door is a great book to read on that because the difference between say like Cobra and Andrew and you know, the, the blue collar millionaire is say you saving, having a million dollars is different than spending it. So yeah. if you, if you have a million dollars, 
and you're even if you wanted to get yield off it or whatever, you'd be lucky if you could get kick off 80 grand in cash flow off the million. You'd be lucky if you if you levered up, got some prop, maybe. So you're really only making 80,000 a year, even if you're a millionaire. But if you, you know, some guys get a million dollars and they buy three or four cars and that looks rich to people. People go, yeah. that looks rich. And then there are people with 50 million who buy those cars and it looks rich to them. So if, if you have two Lamborghinis to the, the most men who don't know much about this kind of stuff, that looks as rich as a 50 millionaire. Even if the person was only a 500,000 heir and they spent all their money on cars. And I'm not saying that that applies to Andrew or whatever, but that's, that's what really bothers people. So yeah, this idea that rich people are X is absurd. I've known, I, I mean, I'm not going to name drop, but I know plenty of people who are, have extreme net worth and there's no way you could classify them as X. They're completely different. Some of them are total beta cowards who voted for Trump and they're terrified people find out even though there were $200 million and what really can they do to you? Other people are completely, they own it. They own their wealth. They're outspoken. They go by their things. Other guys are t live in terror of their wives, completely henpacked at home. Others are complete, you know, they have open relationships, every kind of variety of a person. And, and that I think is, makes it interesting, but how do they get rich? And you should, I should do a podcast on that. There is something that people have in common on how everybody got rich, how they live when they're rich. That's different. And I think that's a good way to end the podcast. Yes, it is. Uh, another great episode, Mike. And, uh, you know, thanks for, uh, for hanging out again.